So, so today what I'd like to do is spend about 30 minutes, talk a little bit about uh, fluid biomarkers and how we can apply those in, in PKD. You know, really what this presentation is a primer for really session three, for thinking about how the consortia can move forward. Um, you might remember, whoops, sorry. You might remember uh, this slide from previously, uh, I think we shared this at the beginning of this year, 2020, about thinking about what the opportunities were across the consortia. Clearly biomarkers, specifically fluid biomarkers, are an opportunity uh, for the consortia. The nice part is we have, you know, moved forward with other activities as well within the consortia, particularly around, you know, improving the uh, current um, uh, total kidney volume uh, a quantitative model. And, What's going to happen around that and, and, and we've established a few collaborations there and we'll go ahead and move forward likewise you know we've been talking a little bit about um, cds data standards and how we can uh, improve our, our current uh, therapeutic uh, area standards but today i want to really focus on uh, fluid-based biomarkers you know this is a similar slide to what we showed at the uh, beginning of the year as well right about how we could basically utilize the consortia to go ahead and really define a path forward, taking advantage of the fact that we have, you know, invested stakeholders, shall we say, within this space. And so let, let, let me go ahead and, and, and work through some of the thinking here. So really, I, I think what we need to do is, is first of all, do an assessment of the, the PKD biomarker landscape. In other words, you know, what information is actually out there? And, and how do we, you know, what information are we able to utilize? And then go ahead and really define a roadmap by which we could go ahead and then focus around, you know, biomarkers, fluid-based biomarkers, and working towards receiving regulatory endorsement around those biomarkers. You know, this would include really uh, an in-depth evaluation around any cl uh, uh, clinical validation data analytical validation data that's available, as well as making sure that there is actually patient level data available for us to utilize in this effort. So really what it would be is, you know, creating that landscape to understand, you know, what biomarkers are out there and how we can basically leverage those. You know, doing a, a, a very um, a brief review of the literature, it, it's clear that, that there are a number of biomarkers that have been evaluated um, within PKD patients. You know, these, these include both serum as well as urine-based biomarkers. However, you know, looking across the literature, serum creatinine is the only biomarker that's really utilized um, reliably across studies. Um, and the other biomarkers just are not uh, systematically applied yet. I've listed a few biomarkers below that, that have been evaluated across multiple manuscripts. Um, I, I've also included RAC1, which was uh, presented by uh, Frank in his presentation uh, as a biomarker for looking at a podocyte uh, injury. I mean, looking at these biomarkers, I mean, immediately you can see that these biomarkers are beginning to to break into different classes of biomarkers. Those that look at specific cell injury like RAC1 or like KIM1, um, and then those that look at inflammation such as uh, MCP1, um, and those that are a bit more functional to how the kidney is actually working such as albumin and, and uh, immunomycoglobulin uh, G. But what there really is is a need for a systematic evaluation of, of all the, the biomarker data that's out there. And, and that's what I think really one of our next steps needs to be is to really identify what type of information out there. You know, over the past couple months, you know, I have been doing some reviews of the data uh, that, that's available, but it's, it's not near enough. We need to have a, a larger commitment around that to really understand what the opportunities are. And, and, and when we begin to think about biomarkers and the evaluation of, you know, whether those biomarkers are ready to be used within drug development, I, I think we need to take a big step back. And, and, and what that very first step needs to be is to identify what the drug development need actually is that we're trying to overcome with these biomarkers. So what's the problem? What's the issue? 
And the nice part, because the consortium is comprised of a number of members from, from industry, both pharma as well as biotech, I think that we need to rely uh, on these stakeholders to basically identify uh, those gaps for us. You know, it, do we need more enrichment biomarkers? Do we need pharmacodynamic biomarkers? And before I say it, I already know the answer. We need surrogate endpoints. I get it. But there's a path to get us there, right? And I think this is the path that, that, that starts us. Likewise, we have to think about how these fluid-based biomarkers can also be used synergistically with, um, with total kidney volume, right? We have a great biomarker out there already, an imaging biomarker, but how do we uh, supplement um, that biomarker with fluid-based biomarkers? I think the next step after we identify those gaps is really to then make sure that we can define a specific regulatory need that we're trying to fill, right? That this biomarker can meet and overcome that gap in, in the, the, the regulatory arena. Then I think what the, the, the important part is to then look across these different biomarkers or individual or panels to make sure indeed they're, they're filling that need from a biological sense, right? That it makes sense that these biomarkers actually can overcome that need. And, and then I, I think what it is is really a deep dive into the, the biomarkers, right? Understanding, you know, how they're behaving, you know, how the, the, the physiology and the path of physiology relate to how these biomarkers are actually responding. And very importantly, making sure that available data sets are, are there for us to be able to use. Now look, looking, you know, even my scant review of the literature has indicated to me that all the data is not there, right? We're probably gonna have to think about how we collect additional data sets uh, beyond retrospective data, but we can talk about that and come up with mechanisms to do that. So, so, so again, really thinking about, you know, these, these different areas of interest, you know, is it worthwhile to think about um, uh, additional biomarkers for prognostic biomarkers, say for patient selection or enrichment. I, I mean, I think during our experience with total kidney volume, we've, we've identified the fact that um, uh, uh, we have both individuals that are going through rapid and as well as slow progression of the disease. Would additional biomarkers actually help to, to identify those individuals? One could think that if indeed you had a, a number of, of rapidly progressing individual patients, that um, uh, the, the length of the trial would be would be shorter, right? Because these folks are going to experience the disease quicker, and so that's a shorter clinical trial. Likewise, uh, one of the gaps with with TKV that I think we all realize is that it's probably not going to be um, um, suitable uh, where the kidney's not increasing in size rapidly, right? And so if we look at our, our pediatric uh, PKD patient population, there may be a need for supplementary biomarkers there. Um, there are definitely other drug development gaps that I haven't listed here, but really, you know, that's where we're looking to the industry stakeholders to say, this is what I need to help drive my programs so that we can get um, drugs out to these patients. So what this does really is it then allows us to begin to prioritize the, these different approaches, right? You know, um, you know, do these given biomarkers, you know, support uh, the, this this unmet need or gap? You know, do they align with specific uh, regulatory objectives? You know, is there utility across a large class of drugs? I, I mean, I think when we're looking at biomarkers, in some cases, we can find some biomarkers that are very specific to a given class, but other biomarkers, which are probably more appealing to stakeholders are those that um, uh, can, can cross uh, uh, across classes. Um, and then also, uh, as I said before, you know, uh, uh, availability of clinical data is, is, an absolute, is absolutely important in order for us to be successful. So, you know, digging in a little bit deeper, you know, and in, in, in thinking about how we can evaluate um, these biomarkers, you know, one of the big things that we need to think about is biological plausibility, right? Does, the, does it make sense the biomarker is actually doing what it's doing, right? And, and giving us data around what we, we think it's giving us data around. Now, you know, that's not an absolute imperative, right? Um, and then, you know, for, for, for the more advanced classes of biomarkers, like a surrogate endpoint, Absolutely, They're, the biology has to link 
to how that biomarker is actually resp uh, is responding. But you know, for for prognostic biomarkers, in some cases, you really don't need to have that as much of that biological plausibility there. It just has to be giving you information that you can react to, and it has to be reliable. Likewise, we have to think about you know the clinical validation uh, associated with that biomarker. And if we don't have that clinical validation, what is it going to look like um, um, in order to basically demonstrate the fact that the biomarker is doing what we say it's uh, doing? And then, of course, you know, analytical validity of, of the bio, uh, of being able to measure the biomarker. You know, really, that comes down to this um, um, uh, illustration here, which really talks about how do we know that we have a reliable biomarker, right? And it really comes down to two primary factors, right? Number one, we're using, well, I guess it's three, right? Number one, we're gonna use the biomarker correctly, right? And that's what that context of use gets at. But the other two important points are really being able to measure the biomarker uh, robustly and, and, and reliably, but then also being able to demonstrate that the biomarker does what we say it's gonna do. And so I think those are the two big concepts that we need to think about as we move towards establishing you know, reliable biomarkers. So what I'd like to do now is take a little bit of a turn, and I'd like to talk about a qualification that's going on within the Predictive Safety Testing Consortia uh, in collaboration with the uh, foundation of the National Institute of Health Biomarker Consortium. And this is around a, a set of uh, safety biomarkers. As, as everyone on this telephone call knows, or on this TC knows, um, you know, our, our gold standard um, serum creatinine is not a very sensitive biomarker. And it really, you really don't see a significant change with, with drug-induced um, acute kidney injury until you see about 50 to 60% kidney loss. And so what the objective of this project is, is to find biomarkers that are more sensitive to um, kidney injury. Now, it, it makes sense that serum creatinine isn't a very responsive biomarker. It doesn't mean it's a bad biomarker, it's a functional biomarker, and there's functional redundancy built into the kidney, and so thus it's a slow responding biomarker. The biomarkers that we have, the eight biomarkers that we have listed below really aren't functional biomarkers for the most part. And instead, the, these are biomarkers that, that um, are, are basically release biomarkers for the most part, um, where we can um, go ahead and, 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 and more quickly measure injury. You know, of, of course, albumin and cystatinacy sit a little bit more in that serum creatinine uh, area, but you know, still uh, valuable biomarkers. So the first thing that we did was we created a context of use. We said, this is how we want to use these biomarkers, right? We identified what types of biomarkers they were. They were the safety biomarkers. We want to use them with the conventional biomarkers, such as serum creatinine. What do these biomarkers do? Well, they respond to mild uh, injury of the, in the kidney. And, and where do we want to use them? Well, we want to use them in healthy volunteers, so phase one studies, as well as in patient studies, and those patients have to have normal kidney function. So with the context of use, hopefully you're seeing here, we were, we were able to very nicely refine exactly how we're going to use the biomarkers, what fashion we're going to use those biomarkers, and you know what answers we're going to get, and then also what the patient population where these biomarkers would be applied. So we've conducted a series of studies, and, and actually, you know, these are translational safety biomarkers. So we relied very heavily on non-clinical animal data to actually support the utility of these biomarkers. Um, and um, I'll, I'll take you through step by step each each of these uh, studies and how we interpreted that data. But you know, in the non-clinical phase, we were quite successful, right? We qualified you know, um, seven of these biomarkers. We, we, we created supplementary data for additional biomarkers as well that we wanted to use in the clinic that weren't included in that first qualification. We then entered into a clinical phase where basically we had a, a learning phase where we looked at how the biomarkers were responding in a small patient uh, population. That actually resulted in a qualification, and we'll talk more about that. It's a very limited qualification, but still it gives us the ability to be able to utilize these biomarkers early on 
before we finished our confirmatory studies. And in our confirmatory studies, you know, we used two um, drugs that, that, that we know one of the side effects are uh, is a, a kidney injury. And uh, we basically used you know, in prospective studies um, uh, those the, that approach to, to go ahead then and uh, and confirm you know our initial data from our learning phase studies. So interestingly, the strategy that was used to pick the biomarkers had probably less to do with the fact that they weren't quote functional biomarkers like serum creatinine. But instead, that they covered the uh, the nephron um, to be able to to look at, at different types of injury, because we know that drugs actually affect different regions of the nephron. You know when they're toxic, um, simply due to the, the, the their mechanism by which they, they, they cause toxicity. Here's a um, graph that really outlines really the, the overall clinical uh, validation strategy for you know, translational biomarkers. And then you can see that we start off with the non-clinical species using histopathology really as the, the truth or the current standard and demonstrate that the biomarkers um, uh, respond to that histopathological injury. You know, I think one of the first things is that we made sure that these novel biomarkers were found both in the urine of, of animals as well as humans. Thus, we knew we could translate those. You know, in the human studies, you know, we don't have the opportunity to use histopathology as, as an endpoint. And so what we do there is we use medical adjudication as well as the standard biomarkers to go ahead and describe whether or not those biomarkers are having the desired effect. Let's go a little bit more into depth. I'll quickly move through the non-clinical studies, but, but really what we're doing here is we're looking across prototypical nephrotoxicants as well as prototypical non-nephrotoxicants, looking at uh, histopathology, um, uh, current standard biomarkers such as serum creatinine, and the uh, um, novel biomarkers. And really what the objective here is, is to assess the degree of tissue injury, to, to make sure that the, the, the biomarkers um, are, are not responsive to other tissue injury, and, and then to also then uh, define that the biomarkers aren't acting on a single mechanism of toxicity. And then really our, our, the whole idea of any type of, of biomarker clinical validation is really to, to create a correlation with the truth, right? And that's histopathology in our case, and the response of the biomarker. So that's exactly what we did, was across multiple toxicants, we, we looked at basically the response of these biomarkers, compared that to serum creatinine. Here I'm showing a graph of uh, Kim-1 compared to serum creatinine. Um, uh, and then what we did was we, we took this data and basically transformed it and, and now looked at curves to be able to demonstrate rock curves, to be able to uh, demonstrate the sensitivity and the specificity of these biomarkers. And, and what we basically found, and, and you can see that extrapolated on the, the, the two graphs to the right, is that many of these biomarkers, including KIM-1 and NAG shown here, are actually more responsive so then serum creatinine, so more sensitive at it when there's a minor amount of injury, right? This mild or minor injury um, compared to um, uh, when there's a more significant injury because serum creatinine then catches up. Still, we, we have a higher AUC, which is indicating um, greater uh, uh, specificity and, um, and sensitivity. And again, as I stated before, you know, these biomarkers went through the FDA qualification process. They also went through the EMA and PMDA qualification process and were, were, were deemed suitable to be used in rodents and on a case-by-case -case basis in the clinic. And I think that's important because that gave us really that step to where we could, you know, then begin thinking about how we could apply these biomarkers clinically. Um, there was also a letter of support for two other biomarkers, uh, the osteoponin and, uh, and NGAL, um, to uh, uh, go ahead and, uh, because those, those weren't um, included in the original qualification, but to substantiate their, their, their ability to detect uh, um, uh, tubular injury. 
again, moving on to now the, the clinical side, you know, it's, it's a little bit different here because now we really don't have histopathology to, to guide us and act as our truth. Um, instead, we're looking at this, the standard um, uh, biomarkers and comparing the response of our biomarkers. But there's a problem there, right? Because if I have biomarkers that are more sensitive than my standard, my current standard biomarkers, those are all then viewed as false positives, right? And, and so there goes an issue that, that we need to think about because if you're more sensitive, you're detecting these cases earlier, and it doesn't allow the serum creatinine or other biomarkers to detect those. So what we've done is, is basically also are using medical adjudication, using expert adjudication to go ahead and identify those in, in individuals with, with, with kidney injury. Now, what we've done in, in the case of the kidney safety biomarkers is to really use drug-induced um, toxicity to go ahead and show the utility of these biomarkers. But in other programs, we've actually used disease-induced tissue injury to also uh, demonstrate utility of these safety biomarkers. And so here, the correlation, we're saying that the truth is truly a med medical adjudication, and then we're comparing that to the response of the biomarkers. Um, there were two phases, as I spoke of before. There was the learning phase, which basically was a, a healthy volunteer study where we understood the uh, baseline or the basal states of these uh, biomarkers uh, and their concentration in urine. And then we used a, a retrospective uh, uh, set of samples where, uh, where individuals were uh, uh, treated uh, for mesothelioma with uh, high doses of cisplatin. Uh, this eventually, as I said, resulted in the quali uh, an initial qualification and um, and, and now what we're doing is we're completing our confirmatory studies. Here's the data from, from uh, uh, looking at the healthy volunteers and, and looking at the, the, the mesothelioma patients. On, on the far right, you can, in this column, you can see basically the response in healthy volunteers to a change in the biomarker. So the biomarkers were, were measured a few times within these healthy volunteers. And we basically are looking at the variability um, um, uh, response uh, of these biomarkers. It's relatively low. Um, you do see changes, but uh, again, it's relatively low. Um, what we see in, in, in this, uh, this uh, second uh, column here are patients that have been treated with, with cis, uh, cisplatin uh, mesothelioma patients but have medically relevant increases in their serum creatinine. And we can see, as expected, each of the biomarkers responded extremely well between you know, 95 and 100%. The interesting part of this data set is the, the column here shown in red, where these are the patients without a significant increase in, in serum creatinine or medically relevant increase in serum creatinine. And what we see is that our biomarkers, our novel biomarkers, um, which we hope would be more sensitive, indeed are more sensitive, where we see them responding before um, serum creatinine actually responded. Again, as I said, this initial data set um, allowed us a qualification. Again, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it, um, this qualification is, is limited in its scope, right? A, a little bit different of a context of use than what I originally described for the overall project. Here, what we have is that, uh, again, the, the uh, a composite of these biomarkers, right, an equally weighted composite, um, can be used in conjunction with traditional methods, serum creatinine, to aid the, to the detection of kidney tubular injury in phase one studies, right, healthy volunteers. But I think the important part here is this is in a cohort, right? It's not in an individual level. Um, you know, is this the final qualification that we wanted? No, no, it's not. But what it has given us is the ability now to apply these biomarkers um, uh, uh, in drug development and learn how these biomarkers are, are actually uh, performing. We have a very well-defined flow scheme by which um, investigators and drug development studies can apply these biomarkers. And as you can see, basically, what we're talking about is 
the uh, these biomarkers basically moving outside of the composite measure, moving outside the statistically expected uh, uh, levels of these biomarkers uh, within a clinical study. And what that would then do is the investigator would, you know, pause and, and look to see if, if indeed there, there, there is, you know, associated kidney toxicity. Again, it's not the end all decision. Instead, you know, this data is being used with all of the data that's being collected during phase one to make decisions on whether or not um, uh, kidney uh, injury is occurring. I think one of the other important fashions is that this bio, these sets of biomarkers are not to just be used on all studies, but instead they're to be used when there's actually a, a preclinical signal that, that, that kidney toxicity can occur. Why? Well, I mean, we don't understand these biomarkers completely at this point, right? There's still a bit of learning, but what we want to do is to be able to have additional data be generated and shared across the community on how these biomarkers are, are responding. You know, our next big step really is the, the finalization of the immunoglycoside and cisplatin study. The um, clinical portion is, is completed. All of the samples have, have been collected. Um, uh, as you can see in the, the uh, aminoglycoside, uh, we looked at cobramycin, and that was in uh, patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, and, and you can see the way that that study was laid out. Um, likewise, in the cisplatinum uh, study, we were looking at uh, patients with uh, head and neck cancer. And, and again, you can see how that study was uh, laid out. Um, the the endpoints to the um, uh, confirmatory studies are really twofold. There's a formal adjudication process, which is going to be conducted to, to go ahead and, and basically, you know, demonstrate uh, how well these biomarkers are working. But we also have an agreed to predefined statistical evaluation um, that's also going to be conducted. Really our primary endpoint is the uh, uh, formal adjudication. Why are we doing this predefined statistical evaluation? Well, we may find out that these biomarkers are behaving in these studies well enough that we could just rely on statistics and not have to go through a formal adjudication in their actual implementation in uh, drug development studies. But again, you know, we, we, will, we will find that out. So taking us now back to what we're thinking about in the PKD space, you know, Clearly, there's a lot of learning that we can take from the kidney safety biomarkers. But I think we have a lot of groundwork to do in being able to identify what biomarkers we might be interested in, in, in characterizing and, and then seeking regulatory endorsement around. I, I think we have a lot of opportunities as far as, you know, retrospective data sets that are out there. I think we can take advantage of that. Um, and I think we have the stakeholders right, across industry, academia, the foundation, where we can begin to think about how we can also then generate, you know, prospective data, if indeed that needs to happen. I mean, we know that the PKD Foundation is spending a lot of time and energy uh, around their registry. Could this help facilitate and, and create some of the samples, some of the data that would re be required for you know, um, um, pursuing these biomarkers. Likewise, we, we know that there are a number of ongoing clinical trials within the PKD space. Can we take advantage of those trials to go ahead and procure samples and analyze those samples? Um, also, we have the, the very strong academic sites that are working on PKD. Could we leverage those sites to go ahead and think about, you know, common approaches with one of the goals being the identification of biomarkers. So that brings me back to this slide, right? And this is what we're going to be talking about a lot in session three of the uh, uh, of the summit. You know, where do we decide to take the consortium, right? We have a lot of good data that's out there, right? We know that a lot of good research is happening, but how do we best pull that research all together so that we can really then have impact from both a scientific standpoint as well as from a regulatory standpoint so that we enable you know drug development further in this space. 
So with that, I'll stop and, and I'll take questions. And I think I was right about a half an hour. So I'm relatively proud of myself.